Hello. Welcome, oh. everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar on farm management in volatile times. I'm your host, Amanda McLean, the farm management specialist here at North Dakota Farmers Union. A few housekeeping tips before we get started. First of all, this webinar is planned for about an hour. It is also being recorded, so everybody will be on mute. However, if you have any questions or comments throughout today's session, we encourage you to type them into the chat function below, which can be found at the bottom of the toolbar in your Zoom call window. Also, we will have time for Q&A at the end of today's seminar. Um, and if you would like to review this recording, it will be available on our home NDFU page and our YouTube channel. To lead today's discussion on farm management in volatile times, we have partnered up with the North Dakota Farm Management Educational Program. And with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Kyle Olson. Kyle is entering his sixth year as assistant professor in farm management education at Bismarck State University or Bismarck State College. Prior to, um, prior to being assistant professor, he farmed for 28 years near Buxton, North Dakota. During this time, he served as president of the Trail County Farmers Union Board and was board chair of the Buxton Farmers Union Oil and Elevator Company. His years in production agriculture provide practical experience in managing a cash grain operation, obtaining credit and commodity trading, both cash and futures. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Kyle. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> How is the sound coming through? Thumbs up? Great. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds you look good. good, too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the uh, We'll just start in. I did pr uh, put some slides together on a PowerPoint, and I'll just add some comments to um, these, uh, uh, these slides. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Okay, and then we're gonna start our slideshow if I can get rid of that. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> well, coming up with the title for this was a little bit, uh, li little bit challenging because there's, there's so many things that actually go on uh, prior to any kind of decision making, uh, any kind of. Um, um, goal selecting, anything like that. So um, what I tried to do is put together something that would be kind of generic for pretty much every operation, uh, everybody in different age, age groups, uh, whether you're early career, uh, mid career, or uh, looking at uh, uh, getting out of the business, you know, there's, there's always certain things that we um, can look, uh, look at. Um, so basically, the way I put this together is just to say, okay, so I'm meeting somebody for the first time, they just walk into my office or I just walk into their kitchen. So what do we actually need to know about their operation? Um, so if you wanna just take a, a second, um, the uh, what type of history do you have and how accurate is that history? Um, if you've been on electronic bookkeeping uh, for many years and you've been doing a good job, you're starting uh, ahead of most of the people that I that I actually meet with. Um, the uh, the cash flows, I use kind of a different term for that. I use more of a cash ins and outs. Um, I think it's a more. Uh, uh, I'm not trying to oversimplify anything, but I do think it's more of a uh, more of an accurate. Um, depiction of where you're actually at. And one example I'm gonna use on that, the difference between cash flow and cash ins and outs are like operating notes. We don't have to uh, make it more complex than uh, an advance on an operating note is just an inflow. And then a payment on an operating note is outflow towards that, that principal portion and then an outflow towards that interest portion. So if we have all those things Kind of divided out, then uh, we're uh, we're leaps and bounds ahead uh, uh, ahead, and then we basically take those cash ins and outs, and then um, balance them out with some of the inventory changes, some of the loan changes, you know, and so it is actually 
at the end of the day in a cruel based income statement that we want to put together. Um, part of the loan history that I like to look at is that, okay, have, have there been any situations where we had to reschedule that uh, term payment because somehow uh, there was a shortfall? Uh, any kind of real estate that needed to be stretched out, um, any kind of uh, equipment loan or, or cattle loan um, that needed to be uh, spread out, that has um, uh, that tells me something about how well things have been going in the past. Um, yeah, the balance sheet, uh, I can't say that I'm any simpler other than it's a snapshot of what you own and what you owe uh, at any particular time. And then we'd like to look at at least five years of production history. Um, I know with like FSA Bowers, FSA only requires three years, um, but I like to look at five simply because situations like we found in 2021, where it's a very, very unusual year, uh, not only for the amount of government payments, but the production history was, uh, at least out in this area, was just horrible. Uh, I do know certain areas that got a few shots of rain that uh, uh, everybody was smiling all the way to the elevator, uh, but that wasn't our typical case. So we'd like to take a look at that production history. Um, the, the situation I've run into before, if we have a bad year in there, um, I will take that five years and basically turn it into more of an Olympic average. So I throw out the high and the low and we still have that those three years. Um, so anyways, uh, the succession gets to be a bigger part of uh, my job than I guess I anticipated uh, when I started. Uh, people are always looking mid-career, end-career uh, type situations. What are we going to do with this? Uh, can we uh, uh, get a situation where one day the owner-operator is this person and then the next day it's a different person so the question that i often ask is okay is there going to be a next generation coming into this because we will handle things a lot differently um what does family labor look like um the sad part about family farms is that one day they graduate and they move on to their own uh schooling and their own lives and all of a sudden, the, the labor component uh, actually changes quite drastically. Um, how competitive are we in our local areas? Uh, I, I do deal with uh, uh, certain um, townships in certain counties where <clears throat> it's hyper competitive. Um, we've got to maybe have a couple large operations that will uh, bid, um, bid things up quite a bit. Um, that would have an effect on any kind of expansion plans, um, any kind of future with involving maybe another operator, uh, uh, son or daughter or uh, uh, in-laws or even nephews, nieces, nephews, that type of thing. So, and then ultimately, <clears throat> are we gonna need extra capital, extra capital purchases to actually accomplish what you wanna see, want your operation to look like in the future? Um, equipment, um, breeding stock facilities. Uh, I do a lot of um, uh, a lot of work on figuring out if you can afford a nice big shop. Um, I do a lot of work with people that are looking at going from let's say uh, two combines to one. Okay, that's that's still a pretty major capital purchase. But those are just some examples of of some of the things that we actually run through. Okay, so how do we get there? Um, there's a short-term look at, um, there's a short-term view and there's a long-term view kind of looking out further on the horizon just to say, okay, well, it may not, it, we may be cash tight for the near term, but it would probably get better in the long-term. So, um, and again, we always go through this, this historical thing. We always uh, try to figure out what specific, specifically in this operation, what, what does that operation actually look like? Um, the stress tests, we do both short-term and long-term. And all that means is, okay, well, if we're under um, 
a situation where um, financially the operation could get stressed, can we still make it through those tougher times? And we do that by doing the 10% increase in cost, 10% decrease in revenue, that's a 20% swing. Can we, can we still make our payments based on that? Or do we have the capability to go back on to some of that net worth and stretch it out? Should we come short from a, from a cash standpoint? Um, I'm going to, um, at the end of the presentation, there, um, NDSU extension actually puts this out every year. They're always adjusting it. It's more of a long range planning tool. Um, it's, um, it's not supposed to be something you're gonna trade futures on, but it is a number that they put a lot of time and effort in to, uh, to figuring out. There's like a, a more of a long-term average looking out the five, 10 years. Um, that publication is this EC uh, 1090 and at the end of the presentation, I'll pull that up so you know what it looks like. Um, we're always looking at that uh, uh, potential profitability. And when I say profitability, it is that accrual based income statement that we're generating. So, um, and if, if you're a little bit confused about what accrual actually means, I'll give you two examples. Um, let's say on December 15th of 2021, you basically bought all your currency. Let's say it was, uh, 8,000 bucks. Well, on your cash books, it'll be from last year, but it's going to this year's crop. So your actual cost in that corn seed is not zero, even though there wasn't a cash cost to it. Your actual cost was that $8,000. That's an accrual adjustment. Um, we want to associate those costs that come about from those activities we want to assign it to that crop year where it was utilized. Now, the same goes for the inventory side, the, the income side. If you um, bring in 10,000 bushels of corn, you raise 10,000 more, you pull out 5,000 bushels out of the year, there's an accrual adjustment there. Your, your inventories are down by 5,000 bushels. So, again, that crop year. Uh, that you raise that corn is what we want to associate with that year. So we basically, it's what you raised, subtract off what you brought into the year, add in what you brought out of the year. That's kind of a, a simplistic way of looking at it. Uh, and again, that long range plan, we love to take, uh, <laughs> increase your cost and, and decrease your revenues. That we love to take a look at that. It's very important to know okay, what kind of margin are we actually working with here? Um, we're, I was posed the question, okay, so if you're putting like a team of people together, let's use success, the succession planning as, um, as a starting point. Okay, what type of advisors do you uh, want on, uh, want to make sure are involved in the process? Um, I like to include the lender simply because you want to be able to inform them that there are going to be some changes happening. Um, they, you don't have to give them too many specifics until you need to give them the specifics, but I still think that they should be involved so that they know ex exactly what's uh, going to be going on. Uh, the tax professional, um, <clears throat> everybody, well, I should say 95% of people will take a look at what those tax implications are. And it's definitely what I've told people before, it's definitely worth that consulting fee to have them run a, a, a potential scenario for you. Just so in, you know, so if you're selling equipment to a relative, what kind of recaptured depreciation are you going to have? What's the difference between recaptured depreciation? and uh, capital gains type income. Um, they're your professional in this area. We can, I can definitely, I have definitely helped some people get on the right track, but ultimately you want to take it to, to that individual because that's their, that's their uh, expertise. Um, the, the legal, um, any kind of contract, and I've done this fairly um, 
religiously in the past is even if it's a rental contract, I'd like to uh, get that legal professional to dra draft that. Now we can always make some changes on it, um, but I still think it's important um, when you're trying to define um, responsibilities and um, obligations. So um, one of the other examples I'll use is in that rental contract, I've seen several that are um, have bonus systems in place. Um, let's say that the, the uh, producer has an excellent year, good yields, good prices. It gets over, his gross gets over, his or her gross gets over a certain part. And then they share that uh, reward with the landowner. I've seen that happen in several different situations. But again, any kind of contract for deed, uh, any kind of um, succession plan on, on gifting or anything like that, we should have that legal professional involved in that situation. Uh, and then there's, of course, a uh, farm management professional. The only reason that, that the individual would be uh, involved in this is we do take a lot longer look at that production model just to see, okay, can we make any improvements? Um, is there something that we should be aware of? Um, you know, your lender or your tax professional, your legal professional aren't going to care about the age of your cows. The farm management professional will. It's like, okay, have we been replacing this herd um, in a, 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 a methodical uh, type situation? Um, equipment, is the equipment all wore out, whatever. Um, that That's something that a farm management professional can help you out with. And it, you know, there are private people that do this um, within the uh, farm management education. We are publicly funded, it's not free, uh, but it is uh, highly subsidized. So it, it, you do have access to it. Um, okay. <clears throat> we did a survey um, of our um, producers uh, a couple of years ago. We wanted to ask them certain questions and provide uh, kind of, um, uh, evaluation on how we're all doing, you know, what they need out of the program, what they're expecting out of the program, uh, things like that. So we, we did put that together. We found out some interesting things um, within that kind of survey type thing. So um, just to mention a few, um, we have a nice mix of the different types of producers uh, as far as the age groups. We have a lot of different ones that are in different size categories. So I've got them all from, you know, um, 500 acres with 25 cows all the way up to, you know, 12,000 acres. Um, so we have a, a really nice broad spectrum uh, that we're, we're taking a look at. Um, for the individual, um, that net farm income number, um, I had a situation a couple of years ago, a partnership was breaking up, uh, two brothers. One brother wanted out, uh, the other brother had his son already starting to try and take over uh, that operation. Um, we had five years of history on him. All we did was basically reorganize it into a report for his lender. It was about 2 million bucks and it took him an hour and a half, you know, because we had this history already put together. So that net farm income with those accrual adjustments, that's one of the benefits that I see is, you know, any kind of major, major thing that's going to happen within that, that production business, uh, we've already got what happened before. Um, no guessing. Um, people tend to shoot from the hip quite a bit, um, but they over over the course of a conversation, you, I can pretty much pick up what they're missing. Um, what we want is an all-in number. And what typically you kind of forget about is things like general farm insurance. You know, what does it cost you per year to insure those buildings and th those animals, those breeding uh, animals? Um, 
the equipment, general liability insurance, the vehicles, all that sort of stuff. People tend to forget that. The other one is utilities. Um, they usually try and load up the, the uh, operation with more than what maybe uh, the operation should be paying versus personal. Um, so we wanna get as close to an accurate number as we can with using that kind of rational um, approach to it. Um, you can update, uh, next one down is, is just updating as you're going along. Um, you can do uh, run some scenarios um, based on, okay, not necessarily looking at a real rosy picture, but you know, let's say we're looking at uh, um, weed harvest coming around the corner. Well, is it gonna be 40 bushels or is it gonna be 60? Well, we can run a scenario at 50 to say, okay, do we have room on that? If we're gonna sell it right off the, right off the uh, combine, do we have room on, uh, enough on that to maybe make some improvements in equipment or in, in facilities before the rest of the crop actually comes off? We can periodically update the information with what was actual. And then um, we can, we're, we're, we're typically always trying to look at, okay, what, what's changed since January when we actually put a projection together? Okay, well, uh, fertilizer was much higher. Um, seed stayed the same. Chemical, I couldn't find the right chemical. So I needed to switch that out. There are certain things that are, you know, always, always going on. So we try and keep, keep abreast of that um, so that we know if there's anything that's gonna be a potential train wreck. Um, farm management process, the, um, we talked about the inflows and outflows uh, versus like a cash flow. Um, we do a lot of uh, loan documentation and, and verification. If you were gonna come into my office, um, you know, this afternoon, what I would first start you with, if you aren't already on an electronic bookkeeping system, is we will get you started on that. I think there's just a lot of um, benefit. Um, there's an ease to it. Um, the difficult part is actually the, the entering the data. That is the, the biggest part of that. Um, but we will also force you to track your loans. Um, so it, when there is an advance, then it's all it is is a deposit into your checking account. When there's a payment, hopefully there's a, a check number to it, but we split it out between interest and principal. So we always have a running balance of what those loans look like. So if you do make an early payment, oh, excuse me, or it's the last payment to be made, you know, that's also a good feeling. So we wanna make sure that we have that, um, that documentation and it's, and it's spot on. Um, yeah, and the rest is just all about projections basically. Um, we like to use that five-year history or a three-year history depending upon what, whenever I approach it, it's what's most realistic. What is most realistic? Um, is it that Olympic average? Um, I had a scenario with uh, a re uh, parts and repairs uh, expense category. Um, parts and repairs, a guy blew up two semis in the, in the same year. Well, one overhaul was 20 grand and the other one was 40 grand. Um, that's an unusual situation. So we don't necessarily want to take in that and say, well, he's going to blow up two semis every year. We're going to try and maybe um, um, put that into a, a different light and use, you know, three other years. <coughs> that would be representative of what they typically do. Uh, some of these major capital improvements, um, I've had people come in and say, "Well, I ne re needed to redo this this uh, well, this irrigation piping, and it cost me eighty grand." Well we would probably not expense that out in that one year, even though on your taxes, you probably could. What we would normally do is put that in as um, a capital purchase as an improvement. And then we take value off 
pretty much every year. So it's not like you're expensing it all at once. I don't think that's a, some of those scenarios. It's it, I don't think it's an accurate number. So we we tend to kind of use our judgment um, quite a bit. And again, when I'm working with somebody on this, they're sitting right here next to me, and we're working through it today together. It's not a situation where they just dump a bunch of stuff off and then a week later I call them up and say it's done. It's no, we work together on these things. Hopefully everybody involved in the operation, the farming and ranching operation is present. So there aren't any miscommunications or missed signals someplace. Uh, I like to have uh, both spouses there. Um, if there's a generational transfer, I want, I want the, the kids there too. So nobody misunderstands what's going on and what the uh, what the future might bring. Um, we talked about balance sheets before. Um, I, I like to look at that year end balance sheet. Um, it is just a snapshot. And that's something sometimes people get, um, they misinterpret it. Um, and what I tell people is, okay, if we're looking at the year, the end of the year, it's 1159 on December 31, and it's a snapshot. It's a financial snapshot of what, you've, what you own and what you owe that particular moment. It doesn't matter, you know, that you're going to have, a, um, you're going to order fertilizer, you know, on 10 a.m. January 1. It doesn't, we don't even include that because it's going to be ordered after that first of the year. It's going to be in next year's cash business. It won't be on this balance sheet at all. Um, the way we do things on the agricultural side, we do separate it out between current, intermediate, and long-term, both on the asset side, which is what you own, and the liability side, which is what you owe. Um, one of the things to measure your uh, stability is how much more uh, cash and inventories you have than current liabilities, what you owe within the next 12 months. Cash flow is important. Um, like I said, it's for me, it's, it's all about the inflows and outflows. And whenever we do a projection, it's basically just what do you project the, all the inflows and the outflows are gonna be for that year. Okay, so let's get on to basically the farm management education program. Um, there are several different locations around the state. Um, we are uh, supported by the Career and Technical Education Department of, of, uh, from North Dakota here. They're based out of Bismarck. They do a lot of the um, shop programs, um, the FFA programs, things like that around the state. And we're just something else that they basically handle. So um, we answer to them. We do have host schools. Um, so basically the ones are, you know, BSC here, uh, Lake Region State College, uh, Dakota College, Botano, and then of course, State School of Science at Wapiton. Um, The website at the top there, ndfarmmanagement.com. I'll show that website to you uh, at the end of the presentation also. Um, but here's just a listing of the individuals in, involved and um, the, the instructors. Um, and then we'll, we'll get to the, uh, the, the details about contacting them uh, uh, after uh, a little bit here. Okay, so how do you enroll? Um, basically, if you're a BSc here, you're a non-degree student. So there's no transcript. It doesn't add to your trans transcript at all. You're just a non-degree seeking student. Um, most of the um, host schools will require both enrollment in a fall semester and in a spring semester. But based on where you're at, you know, we're not ter territorial or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> but it, for convenience and for access, I think it's um, important that you uh, choose that program that's that's most uh, uh, or closest to you. Now, I have had situations where um, 
one of the uh, producers um, took over his father's operation down at Henninger, but he still lived in Bismarck Mandan. Well, I'm, it's okay if I meet across town with them. <laughs> uh, another situation, it was Botano, and um, the, the producer and his family lived in Mandan. So he just went up and put the crop in, hired the crop being taken off. So situations like that I know are a little bit unique, but I, I think it would, uh, uh, to make things work, work the best, uh, pick uh, an individual that's, that's closer to your area. Uh, the costs, yeah, BSC is at a grand right now, a thousand bucks, um, and that would be for two semesters. The advantage that we have, we have several different, we have about three different uh, funding sources for tuition reimbursement. They're basically just grants. Um, what would have to happen is you would have to enroll, pay your tuition, and then we apply for these grants to get you reimbursed. Um, they're not 100%, but we can certainly have a large effect, especially with somebody that's just starting out. Um, if you've been farming and ranching for less than 10 years, we can, we can do a lot with these three different grants uh, to help you um, um, help pay for your knowledge, if you will. Um, yeah, probably about 70%, I would say. We could, uh, we could probably uh, get back for you. Uh, again, the main thing here is the, to, to make sure that you're, you're aware of it. You know, BSC would charge you the 500 bucks for the fall. And we're, like I said, just a couple pennies shy, shy of a thousand bucks for the year. Um, you pay your tuition in the fall. We apply for a grant for the fall. And then you sign up for spring, pay your tuition. We apply for a grant in the spring. So, um, and the only limitation is, um, you have to be an active agricultural producer. And it doesn't matter if you've got five cows with an FFA project uh, or 500 uh, and you've been going for you know 30 years. Um, that part doesn't matter to us as long as you're an active agricultural produ producer. Um, so we don't deal with plumbers, we don't deal with electricians, uh, that type of thing. Uh, we're, we're all about the, the egg side. Um, time commitment. Um, the biggest time commitment uh, people will have within the program is tracking their own information. Okay, so um, we talked about the electronic bookkeeping. I would set you up on Quicken. Um, some of the production stuff um, would probably be Excel spreadsheets, but you got to provide that information to not only the lender, but also probably your crop insurance. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're just trying to expand that um, uh, and get it in basically just one point, uh, one spot. Uh, I know with the cattle, uh, we've been starting in with uh, the SHAPS program in a couple operations that's based out of NDSU. It's, it's a herd tracking uh, system. Uh, so if you, um, have an ear tag number, we can track that, uh, how well that animal is doing for you. Um, so anyways, if you're starting from zero, yeah, it's gonna take a little bit to get up and running. Uh, what I did when I was farming is every Sunday morning, I'd be the first uh, one uh, up and I'd grab my cup of coffee and I'd at least enter my carbons off my checks into my Quicken. So if you're diligent about that, you know, you do it like once a week, uh, with the online banking now, it's it's um, it's immediate access to the information. So if you're diligent about it, it doesn't seem like it's going to take a lot. I have run into several scenarios where they're really good until about the middle of March, and then they don't touch it again until November. That it seems that to them seems like a huge time commitment. So rather than doing 20 minutes a week, they've got. 25 hours in in November <laughs> so again the time commitment is just how how efficiently that you're tracking your own information um I like the four hour time slots so let's say that I'm running out to uh, a producer's um, uh, particular farm um, and it's an hour drive out hour drive back I want a four hour time slot 
Um, I think it's uh, spending too much time behind the windshield is not productive for anybody. Um, usually we can get a lot done, a tremendous amount done in that type of time slot. And I've noticed with several of my producers that you get beyond four hours and they start kind of glossing over. There's so much information that we've covered that beyond that, it tends to um, it tends to fall apart a little bit. Um, I do know that like with um, the FSA borrower training that we also do, um, sometimes it isn't, um, it doesn't work out real great, but then we have more meetings. So if you're uh, starting from scratch, I would say, um, you know, four, four hour meetings will get you up and running and, um, and then it's up to you after that. Um, the projection, yeah, I, once we have the, the data from the history, the projection is easy peasy. Um, yeah, and that's about it, I guess, for time commitment. And if you have any questions on what that looks like, you know, let me know. Okay, we do utilize the data. Okay, so when we talk about this um, income statement that, um, that I'm helping the producer develop, with the accrual adjustments. Yes, we do send that information into NDSU. Uh, Dr. Brian Parman is, um, has taken over that role. Um, we do regional averages and we do state averages. Uh, we do a beef handbook. Um, the, uh, when we send it in, all it is, it's not Joe Farmer and then, um, but it's basically just a number. It's a farm number that we've assigned to that producer. So when NDSU gets it, all they get is the number and the financial data. Uh, confidentiality, if, if uh, I'm visiting with a producer, um, that information, any of that information stays between myself and the producer. Um, if you think about um, your lender, <clears throat> the fact that they can't really talk about anything within your operation, I I take that same viewpoint. Is that it's nobody else's business but yours, and you can um, you can trust me with whatever financial information that uh, that we need. It all stays here. Okay. Wow, that went fast. <laughs> well, uh, we'll open it up for questions now. Sorry. Uh, one thing too, also that uh, publication that Kyle was talking about from NDSU, the short course, we will put that into the chat function. So if anybody wants to click that link, it will take you directly to it. Also, we will put in the link to the North Dakota Farm Management Program if you guys are interested or want to find some contact information if you're in a particular part of the state. Um, and want to reach out to some of those in that area. But um, the first question I'm going to ask you, Kyle, is it kind of goes back to that strategic planning. So when developing a, strate a strategic farm plan management, what important things should I consider for the future or the next generation? Well, the main thing is to make sure that your all your costs are accurate. And this is a comment that I heard from... Uh, another instructor basically, um, his comment was, you know, the only thing you can really control are your costs. Mother nature is in a lot of control on the yields. And if you're talking about marketing, um, God help you if you, if you think you're in charge of that either. Uh, so that would be a part of what, what I would look at first is we have to have a realistic view of where those costs are gonna come in. Um, from the revenue side, yeah, if, if, uh, if your five-year average or your county average on corn is 100 bushels, let's, let's not use 125 just to make it work. I, like you said, it's, it's got to be a realistic type situation. I did, uh, this would have been last summer, summer of 2021. I helped with about five different real estate deals. They were all young producers, um, and um, they took on uh, quite a bit of debt in some of those situations. Um, 
is it a realistic idea that they can pay for it? Yes, um, it was simply because we had their information, we had the outlook, um, and it's turning out like it um, it was a smart move to make at that time. Uh, even though it was wildly expensive compared to when I bought land in the 80s. <laughs> some of it, yeah, some of it's sticker shock, honestly, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty outrageous in some of these situations. But um, that would be my main thing is that, you know, if, um, well, and especially with young kids, one of the things that people forget about is like a, a daycare payment, or um, um, the uh, family portion of the health insurance. You know, if, if uh, there's an off-farm income, a lot of times there's off-farm off benefits to it, but not a lot are full family benefits. So in the case of health insurance, a lot of times, you know, that, that gets deducted from their check for the rest of the family. So it's things like that we'd never want to forget about. And yeah, there gets to be a point where the daycare bill is going to go down, but you know what, it's going to be there for a while. So <laughs> until the school system takes over, I guess. So. Right. And now you mentioned um, you are certified in like succession planning, right? And I believe a few other instructors from the North Dakota, North Dakota Farm Management Education Program are as yep. well. Yep, myself and, and I know Jason is, and, um, and there are three more going through the training now at the end of August. Um, International Farm Transition Network is the place we had, um, well, what was it, like a four-day, um, just um, um, uh, a real aggressive type of schedule, and we ran through a lot of the, the detail. And I guess if, if you're thinking about, well, where would I start with a family, it's, um, it's, I usually start with mom and dad, just to say, okay, what do they need uh, to live off when they're retired? Um, and then I go into, you know, what that next generation, what can they afford? And again, it's, we can combine some histories here um, with yields and so forth. Um, but I also like to make sure that mom and dad have enough. So. Okay. Um, another question for you that came in is uh, kind of going back to that data that you guys collect and then share um, the averages with NDSU, what has been the annual economic gain of participants who have participated in the North Dakota Farm Management Program? And maybe that's kind of hard to based on different operations, but do you guys kind of have an average of what their gain has been? Yeah, we actually did a survey uh, statewide and we did ask that question. Uh, the question that was, um, and we copied it um, from actually Minnesota and I think it was uh, uh, Utah. They both did surveys within their farm management uh, education programs and say, okay, what do you think the value is? So we went to our producers and said, okay, on an annual basis, what do you think the value of this is? And I think the average on, um, if I'm re remembering this correctly, the average, um, was about 11 grand, but the weighted average was like 18,000. So if you took those surveys and said, okay, well, this bracket, there were so many respondents that said it was worth this much. And then another bracket would be higher with more numbers in it. So I did a weighted, weighted average and I did, I think it was like 18 grand. So. Okay. I guess I have one quick question for you. So if I'm a young producer um, and I want to go meet with my loan officer, what are generally some of the requirements, the documents that I should be taking with them when I first meet with them? Um, it, it's very, very similar regardless of what lender you're, you're going to. Uh, and I'll explain it the way the FSA person at the time told me said, we want to know what happened last year. So that would be your cash inflows and outflows. Uh, we want to see the, the uh, balance sheet and that's that snapshot in time. Uh, and then we want to see a projection for next year. It kind of in that order. So okay. you have, you know, and when we do the, the net farm income number, those accrual adjustments, 
our starting point is always those cash inflows and outflows. Okay, we like to have the bookend balance sheets, but we know the data in the middle is going to have to be there. Okay. Well, I don't see any more other questions coming in. Um, so okay. with that, unless do you have something else you want to share, Kyle? Yeah. Um, can is my uh, screen still shared? Yep. Yep. Okay. So this is just the. Um, uh the farm management website and you can see here that we've got our different regions uh oh, kyle it's still just on the um powerpoint presentation oh okay new share um maybe exit out of the go. powerpoint presentation okay sorry about that How about that? Yep, can see it now. Okay, I just wanted to show you this. Um, state averages are here. Um, we'll just it, everything. Everything's in PDF format. We do produce books and we do mailers and stuff like that. Each one of my producers gets a um, a book for their region. Uh, let's go west region, region four. Um, Yep. There we go. So we have everything basically West River, um, at least south of 200 anyway. Um, I call it West River. Um, but this this is, um, you can access this information however you want to. So if you wanted to know what spring wheat on cash rented acres, that's page 27. I mean, you basically look at, okay, so everybody in the program that raises spring wheat, we have their information. So what is the average for those producers? Are they earning anything? And um, so, I mean, it's a valuable resource for yourself. If you want to start a brand new enterprise, let's say uh, cutting back on wheat acres and adding canola. Well, I've never raised an acre of canola before. What, you know, where do I find the information? Well, this is one, one place where you can, um, can see that, can view it. Um, and then let's see. Oh, come on. There was one other page here. Oh, um, how do you, okay, stop share. Okay. Okay, and then I'm going to start sharing again, hopefully. Come on. Well, now why? Oh, there we go. So what I want to do is I want to share. Okay, and then I will go back. Oh, no. Okay, this is plotting the course. Okay, this is what I mentioned, long range planning uh, prices. So here's just an example of what they do. Like I said, they update this every year. And if you don't know where to go for a number on corn <laughs> for the next couple of years, well, this is a good starting point for that. And we do, like I said, on long range projection, we like to use uh, something that has some kind of basis in um, more than just a guess. Um, and then cattle beef, beef prices are down here. Um, but I just wanted to mention that to you so you know what it looks like. Um, if you're gonna have the, the link on um, in your information, that would be great. Um, but now you know where what it looks like and, and where to go look. And we um, did post that in the chat box again, if anybody wants to find that. And also the direct link to the North Dakota Farm Management Educational Program where you can find those annual summaries that Kyle was talking about. So anything else you wanna share, Kyle, or mention? 
not that I can think of, just, um, you know, if you if you're, go to that website, the farm management website, there is a detailed list of the instructors. So you have more than just a phone number there. You've got an email and, and uh, it, to my knowledge, everybody has uh, a work cell phone. So there's always texting going on and stuff like that. And, um, uh, you know, you don't have to be, you really don't have to have anything from January 1 to today uh, prepared. That's what we're here to help you do is to get caught up and then um, provide the information that you need to, to the people that need it. Um, you know, we talked about the inflows and outflows. Well, guess what? You know, that's what your tax person needs. <laughs> so you got to do it anyway. So why not do it uh, um, uh, accurately? And, um, and we're here to help that. So. Right. Well, um, I don't see any other questions and I think we've uh, shared everything that you had. So again, thank you for everybody who attended today's webinar. We hope that you found it very educational. Um, remember, if you have any specific questions on like farm management or the farm management program, uh, either reach out to me here at NDFU or Kyle or those lists of instructors and we can hopefully get you in connection with the right information that you need. Also, again, special thank you to the North Dakota Farm Management Educational Program and to Kyle for sharing your time and your expertise on this subject. And if you would like to watch this recording, it will be available on our home NDFU page and our YouTube channel and be on the lookout for more educational webinars to be um, held in the future. So again, thank you and everybody have a good day. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.